I love that song from the Resistance Revival Chorus. So what a way to shepherd us into this important conversation this evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us and for sharing this virtual space. My name is Sierra Kaler-Jones, and I am the Executive Director of Rethinking Schools. Today's conversation is being co-hosted by the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective and Rethinking Schools. The Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective is a community of youth organizers, students, teachers, and teacher educators committed to advancing anti-racist pedagogy, curriculum, and practice within K-12 public schools in Connecticut. And Rethinking Schools is a nonprofit publisher and advocacy organization dedicated to sustaining and strengthening public education through social justice teaching, and education activism. Our magazine, books, and other resources promote equity and racial justice in the classroom. I'm thrilled to be joined here and to welcome Natalia Roginski and Daniel Martinez Hosang as co-moderators for tonight's conversation. Natalia is a history educator and organizer with the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective. And Dan, Daniel is a professor of ethnicity race and migration at Yale and a member of the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective Steering Committee. Welcome Dan and Natalia and welcome to everyone. We are so grateful that you're here. 
Oh, hi, hi Natalia. Hi, Sierra. Um, I just want to say on behalf of our collective, it's just such an honor to be in conversation and to be, you know, doing something with Rethinking Schools, which like decades before all of this attention has been on teaching and learning, um, has been doing this work. And Sierra, I just wanted to also congratulate you in your new appointment, the first executive director of Rethinking Schools. Um, so thrilled for you and for the organization um, and a really exciting moment. And I just, you know, we're going to introduce this amazing panel in a moment, but while we have you, um, I want to ask you a question, um, you know, because Rethinking Schools, like, in everything, in the publications, the articles, when we share, when I share them with teachers I work with, they always say like, yeah, this matters. And I can see teachers' voices in this. I can see the voices of students. And that's been such a big part of your work as well, as a scholar, as someone that does creative work, that does consulting, you know, media work. So I just maybe wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about that. Like what's behind that philosophy of why everything has to start when we're talking about public education, it has to start with the voices of teachers and their students. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for your congratu congratulatory note, Dan. I really appreciate it. I'm right over the 30 day mark and really I'm just so grateful to be able to serve an organization that I love and that has shaped me as an educator, a teacher educator and a writer. And so your question makes me think about how Bell Hooks talked about the classroom as a site of radical possibility and how one of my comrades, Allie, who is a middle school teacher, called classrooms experiments and freer futures. And I love that because I think that teachers and students help us to orient the present moment in the historical context, allowing to view ourselves as part of a long legacy of freedom fighters, creatives, and architects really of possibility. And teachers and students, they remind us that there's joy in the struggle, that solidarity is essential, and that justice and love go hand in hand. Their stories give us strategies and tools like asking critical questions, experimenting, collaborating, learning, but also unlearning, analyzing and building. And so I'm really excited to hear from the folks that we have on the panel today, because I know that they're gonna be talking about some of these strategies, these tools, but also the dreams and the possibilities for the future. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from them today. And so, Natalia, I'd like to turn to you next because the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective has brought together educators and students for conversations in previous webinars. And this webinar actually builds on a previous webinar. And so our, our event today um, is building on a webinar that you all hosted in January titled Beyond Schools in Crisis. So can you tell us about what that discussion revealed and, and what you learned so we can really ground ourselves in that foundation for today? Yes, absolutely. So we organized the previous panel and we called it Beyond Schools in Crisis because we are tired of schools in crisis, both the narrative of failing public schools and also the conditions that create crisis in our schools. So this panel brought together Connecticut students and youth organizers, new and veteran teachers and union leaders to discuss the realities that are facing our schools, many of which we feel are misrepresented and misunderstood in the mainstream media. And our panelists identified so clearly the real challenges in our schools, but they didn't approach this with hopelessness because they know that another way is possible. And they spoke of so many systemic solutions. And I hope that this panel revealed that the antidote to the crisis narrative and the crisis conditions is found in the classroom. And students and educators hold the solutions. They deserve decision-making power and working together in solidarity. That's how we're gonna make these systemic changes possible. And so today's panel is meant to build off of this, this previous conversation and to turn our gaze toward the future to consider where do we go from here. And Dan, uh, the title of this panel is a reference to a, a quote, right? And I wondered if you could share a bit about the title for today's event. Where do we go from here? What's that all about? Yeah, yeah. And thanks, Natalia, and Sierra, both for those really clarifying comments. Um, and we'll credit the Ursula and the team at Rethinking Schools for reminding us of Dr. King's 1967 book, it was such an important kind of a vision and framework. Where do we go from here, chaos or community? And we can think of the here in so many different ways, the here and now in panic of the pandemic, 
uh, of the uprisings, of the very coordinated attacks on public schools and public goods and teachers unions and the effort to, to remove that. And, you know, Dr. King, you know, always struck this amazing balance of insisting we have to be so sober in our analysis of the, these, these crises, the material conditions, and yet also reminding us at the same time that no part of the, the crisis is, is um, necessary or preordained or has to be realized, that there are always, always other kinds of possibilities. And that's, of course, like a reminder uh, about keeping cynicism at bay. And you know, he has this kind of wonderful, wonderful formulation at the end about the relationship between love and power. And he says, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. And I think that's such an important reminder that we have to, as kind of Sierra was saying, we have to keep both, right? Love and all of the relationships and the orientations and the aspirations, but also remember that we're very much talking about power and about who wields it, who exercises it, and what does it mean to collectively be able to kind of organize that? Um, so I'm just, again, grateful for that and to, to be able to, um, you know, keep, kind of keep our eyes on the possibilities, right? Not just the despair. Um, so um, Natalia, um, it's always great to be in conversation. I'll turn it back to you for a couple of reminders and then what we're gonna get to our panelists, right? Yes, that's right. And so just as Dan said, we want this to be a conversation and we want it to be as dynamic as possible. So in addition to encouraging our panelists to talk with one another, we want to invite the audience all um, at this moment, 215 of you, to join the conversation in the chat. So please use the chat to share your thoughts, echo resident themes you heard, or just soup up our panelists. And please feel free to tweet about your insights throughout this conversation. We will reserve about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the panel for audience Q&A. So throughout the panel, also, we encourage you to share your questions in the Q&A function so we can collect them um, for our, our closing. Uh, we won't be able to get to all the questions, but uh, we'll make sure to ask those that um, you know rise to the surface uh, and have similar themes. And just a few notes on technology and accessibility before we introduce our panelists. Closed captioning is available and we have two wonderful ASL interpreters. Shout out to Crystal, who you see on the screen right now and Shannon, who will be on in a bit. If at any point you can't see or hear, let us know and we'll do our best to fix any issues. Um, and finally, we'll follow up after the webinar via email with a, a list of resources mentioned throughout the conversation. And there will also be a video of the panel so um, the conversation can live on. So let's let's get to it. Um, who do we have with us today, Sierra? Yeah, so today, just to briefly frame the conversation, we come together to reflect on a few essential questions. So where do we go from here? And as Dan mentioned, that here means so much and can mean different things to each of us. And so how do we build the schools, classrooms, and learning communities that every student needs and deserves? And what role do teachers play in creating these conditions and possibilities? And so with that, I'll pass it over to Dan for, to introduce the panelists as we move forward in the conversation and begin to answer some of those questions. Great, thanks. So for this conversation, we have this uh, amazing panelists as we hear in a moment, but also folks that come from a, a, a wide range of roles connected to schools. So a student, classroom teachers, teacher educator, uh, someone that's doing coaching and ethnic studies, a principal, a union leader representing Oakland, Chicago, Philadelphia, Philly, and Boston. And right, this is all about we're going to be stronger and better if we can think together about these questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, you know, our first two folks. Really thrilled to have Ali Khan Bulani, who's an educator from Berkeley, California, co-principal at Life Academy of Health and Bioscience, which is a public school in uh, the Oakland Unified School District uh, in California in the Fruitvale neighborhood. And then uh, Kate Savato, um, a student, an amazing community organizer on Chicago South Side. So you'll get to hear from them both in a second, but welcome Kate and Ali Khan and Sierra, I'll turn it over to you for the next two. Thank you. I am thrilled to welcome Jackson Potter. Jackson Potter is a Chicago Public Schools graduate, co-founder of the Caucus of Rank and File Educators Corps and vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union. Welcome Jackson. I'm also really honored to introduce Carla Shalaby. Carla is a fierce believer in the power of young children and their teachers, 
and works at the intersections of writing, research, teacher support and development, and organizing to cultivate that belief in and out of schools. Carla is located in Detroit. Welcome. Pass it to Natalia to introduce the final. Yes, joining them, we have Adam Sanchez, a social studies teacher at Central High School in Philadelphia and um, on the editorial board of Rethinking Schools. Also the editor of Teaching a People's History of Abolition and the Civil War, uh, a book that I have used often in my classroom. Um, and in Boston, we've got Nima Avashia, uh, a veteran educator in Boston Public Schools, currently working as an ethnic studies coach. So let's give a round of applause to our wonderful, beautiful, um, wise panelists. And I'll I'll um, keep it here for our first question, which we invite you all to answer. So schools are under so many attacks right now, right? We, we all know this, we feel this. And at the same time, we know that there are so many brilliant and creative practices and possibilities that already exist among our schools, students, and educators. So for this first question, can you give us a specific snapshot or story from your classroom, school, or district that helps us understand why public schools are worth fighting for? And these will just be brief snapshots. Why are public schools worth fighting for? And we'll start with you, Ali Khan. Thank you, Natalia. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Khan Balani, calling in from Oakland, California. Um, so the question is why fight? Uh, for me, it, it begins and it ends with love. Um, I, I really appreciate this framing of love from MLK because that's the definition that I want to use. Um, love, not as emotional bosh as MLK would say, but is strong and demanding love. Um, so at best schools are, 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 are fertile ground for building love um, because they're honest places. In fact, they're some of the only honest places left where we're actually in public institution um, interfacing in a sustained human way for the messiness of humanity and democracy and all the things we dream about. Um, I don't think people really talk about, you know, the post office or the DMV quite that way, but um, we, we fight for public schools because every single person, uh, not just the selected few who mute, meet a criteria for grit or, or some other abstraction deserve to be loved. Um, I think immediately about a student named Cheyenne. Uh, that I taught in grades nine through 11. Um, I used to teach math and by all accounts, Cheyenne struggled with school. Um, I taught her three times because I taught the lower level math classes and she just kept showing up. Um, she ended up in all of them. Um, and I remember in intermediate algebra, this was her junior year of school. Uh, she suddenly just started killing it at math. And, and I remember thinking, this is such a dramatic shift. Cheyenne, what's going on? Like, what, what, why did you just suddenly start to get this math? Did I do something different? Um, and, and her answer always stuck with me, which was um, math was never the problem. Uh, I actually just feel at home here at this school and I feel cared for. Um, so we definitely have a crisis in this country, right? Um, around uh, academic development and all the things that we hear about. But ultimately to me, it's like a crisis of, of like a deeper love. Um, so not only do we need to fight for public schools, but we actually need to fight to build institutions that see love as like the central thesis or a central part of the equation. Um, so if we're rigorous and we're radical about that love, I feel like the academics follow and um, that, that's where I'm at today. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kate. I'm a student. Uh, at Julian High School on the south side of Chicago. Um, I also have ADHD, so holding that question in my head was really hard. <laughs> um, but I think that moments that have resonated with me over time, right, because I think that it's a collective of reasons why we continue to do this work, because it's really, really hard, um, and it takes a lot of energy. But I think a collective of moments has definitely been this year uh, and last year, I think that I was struggling a lot trying to find my place in school last year, but seeing how it's become almost a home, but also how everyone plays different factors into these homes. So when we talk about schools being the hearts of our communities, that means that we actually have to put in the energy to not only be there and be present, but to be able to nourish um, and care and love and 
similar to what was just said, the points of love is that like love is a combination of things, you know, it's kind of what Bell Hooks once said, it's a combination of care and respect. And I think that it's not only just like what has happened that I think is why I fight. I think it's what I would like to see. Um, but I would definitely say it's my peers. Um, it's that feeling of family. Um, and especially being in a school where we're conditioned to be segregated and it's we all look the same um, in our Black people and Black children. For me, it's definitely when we're all just existing um, and being the beautiful humans that we are um, and accepting our own complexity. Jackson, let's hear from you next. Thank you, Ali Khan and Kate. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think similar to what's already been said, schools are sites of struggle. Public education is where we can build movements across our differences, uh, whether it's gender, class, race, ability. And I was at the Alkel Gardens recently, which is a housing, public housing development in Chicago South Side. And it had been labeled by an activist, Hazel Johnson, as the toxic donut, because it's an all black public housing development that had experienced decades of environmental racism, dumping, pollution, mercury, you know, you name it, industrial toxins. And it's under the ground where people live, where people go to school. And we talked with three schools, parents, administrators, teachers, and discussed our vision for a sustainable community school that would help turn the tide by ensuring the crumbling infrastructure was repaired, replaced with you know, uh, heat pumps, with solar, with a solar field that could power the homes as well as the schools, with CTE programming, where young people could develop the next generation of electric vehicles, where they can you know, figure out how to use hazmat suits and go in and remove pollutants and um, address the cumulative impacts that their community has faced over all this time. And it was really empowering and we got a plan of action. And I think prioritizing communities like Elk Elk Gardens is gonna be critical in our work to realize green schools. Thank you. I'm grateful for all those stories already told and for the number of times that love has been raised. And so a story about what it might look like in practice. Um, we had a first grader, a six-year-old suspended from school for three days uh, earlier in the school year. And it's an example of schools just being their own worst enemy. So in the aftermath of the news that we were gonna be missing him for three days, the teacher, a first year teacher, um, got the idea that she really wanted to work with the kids around how we were going to welcome him back. And so I got the great joy of supporting her as a beginning teacher in working with the rest of the children to talk through the fact that he was going to be missing and how were they feeling about the fact that he was going to be missing, which is engendered their own debate around whether or not he deserved to be suspended and what possible alternatives were that naturally emerged from that conversation. And they decided that they were gonna all make him welcome back cards. Um, and to make those welcome back cards, they were gonna think through how he might be feeling upon returning and put themselves in his shoes, imagining how hard it would be to come back to school after having been removed for three days. And so they made all the cards they set them up on his desk for when he would arrive um, in the morning of his return. And then somehow overnight, all of the cards disappeared. And so we don't know what happened to them now. In the morning, these first graders are scrambling to figure out their plan B. And so they just get you know, a giant sheet of that sticky poster paper and they gather in a circle with all the markers and crayons. And like within 10 minutes, they just make this giant welcome back sign. Um, to put on the front of the door and just the image of kind of the tops of their heads all in there together, you know, sharing the colors and sharing the, the crayons and the space. And so that to me is like how Sierra led us with that experiments in a freer futures. That's an experiment in a freer future. Um, and that to me is the promise of public schools that even when the institution itself is doing its worst, the people within it 
are still imagining and enacting an otherwise world in real time all the time. And that to me is the most beautiful thing about the space of public schools. Beautiful answers. Um, I'll, you know, I'll just add that I think because public schools are these places of love and sites of struggle, um, they also have the potential to become laboratories for justice, right? And I think that is the potential danger that the right wing sees uh, with these anti CRT bills and so forth, right? And so I'll give a example, you know, simple example from my class. It, you know, I teach African American history in Philadelphia every year um, since 2020. We've start with, started with a discussion of the questions raised by the Black Lives Matter movement and students investigate the questions of should police be in schools and should we reform, defund or abolish police, right? And when students investigate these questions, they find that um, the people arguing uh, on uh, the side of more funding for police have very little evidence to back up their argument when they read our superintendent, when they read Joe Biden, um, that's the first thing students po point out, right? Um, whereas abolitionists like Mariam Kaba uh, and others, um, they, they are able to find plenty of evidence. Um, and, you know, and not to say that all students immediately become abolitionists, but I think this is just, you know, one microcosm of an example um, that these are the kind of discussions that we can have in public schools. Um, and and it's, there's very few spaces in this society other than activist circles where we invite um, anyone to participate in these kind of conversations. Um, and I think if this is incredibly dangerous to those in power, right? Which is why you see this backlash, um, but it's incredibly crucial that we involve young people in these discussions about how do we move towards a better future? Um, because we see throughout history that it is young people who are at the forefront of pushing um, our, our country, our world to be a better, more equitable, more uh, justiceful place. It's very hard to go last um, because all of those answers are uh, are pretty incredible. I think I would just um, echo the idea that um, schools are incredibly dangerous places to fascists um, because when um, when young people and teachers are in conversation with each other honestly about the oppressive structures that exist in our society and when they're building the tools together to fight back, um, they can be unstoppable. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Boston Public Schools tried to shut down my school, and uh, the young people in our school were very quick to make the connections between gentrification in the neighborhood um, and what it looks like for schools to be gentrified, for schools to be closed and handed over to other entities. Uh, and it was a situation where there weren't answers. And so it wasn't like teachers were in charge. No one was in charge. We were all just responding. All the hierarchy got taken out of the situation, which meant amazing things started to happen. Young people were annotating copies of E. Ewing's book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Shouts to My Chicago folks, um, and like dropping them off to school committee members, right? And hacking into the parent listserv to send emails to parents being like, don't let this happen. Um, they were going to school committee. They were lobbying city councilors. They were fully taking responsibility for their home, for their community and saying like, this is ours and we're not gonna let it go without a fight. And as adults, what we could do is give them language and lenses to help them make meaning of what was happening in the world around them. I think that's what public schools can do is to give young people a space in which to process all of the hard that exists instead of denying that it exists or gaslighting them and saying that they don't, that they're imagining that it exists, we can name it and we can think about what to do about it. Um, and that, that I think is such a powerful thing that, uh, that scares a lot of people who don't want us to do that work. 
I am so glad that we started with this question because I'm just all of your responses are so beautiful and powerful. And um, I think so often schools are talked about, it, especially these days, as these um, like hard, impossible, um, challenging spaces. And, and yes, I mean, they're dynamic. So there are a lot of things. But missing from the conversation is exactly um, what you all are sharing. Schools are powerful places. Um, Dan, you're you're joining us here. What did you think about this first round of responses? Yeah, got you know it's that combination of like when your kind of mind is moved, but also you feel something, you know, kind of across. And I just also just this kind of continued emphasis on schools as a place, this urgent place of right now, not some place that in 10, 15 years is preparing people for a job or something else. Right now, the site in which the biggest, biggest forms of uncertainty and crisis are going to be figured out. Um, so that's just really moving and um, look, kind of looking forward to digging in more. Yeah, and it makes for all the teachers out there, for all the students out there and all the other educators, everyone who works in schools, I hope that hearing those responses just made you feel um, like the work that you do is powerful and that the place yeah. that you go every day is is like a place of, of immense possibility. And I think, um, you know, you all said it like this site of struggle um, that we need right now more than ever. Thank you yeah. all. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. Um, so we're going to go into a, a second round, and we're going to do this in conversations, kind of groups of three here. So really happy to have Kate, Alakan, and Carla uh, join us for the first round. So um, uh, great to be with you all. You know, we're at this moment when many educators just you know, both feel under attack um, and a growing sense of just kind of outrage and frustration about what the future holds. And we've all seen these surveys that show just a growing number of colleagues considering leaving the profession, or if not that, compelled to in some way restrict what or how they teach out of fear of uh, censure or punishment. Um, but we also know this picture is not complete. Uh, there's so much more, as Natalia was saying, happening in our school. So for this round, we want to really think with you all and with the panelists in your role as, as teachers and educators, students, organizers, writers, administrators, union leaders, um, despite all these attacks, kind of what um, keeps you going, gets you to take action, organize, and build solidarity. And Kate, um, let's start with you again. Um, one of the main narratives that certainly we're hearing all about, like, you know, as, as it pertains to students, is about, quote, learning loss and young people in crisis. Uh, but this leaves out so much, right? It re re reproduces this kind of deficit framework, students as problems, right, that need to be fixed in some ways. Can you paint a picture for us about the work you do um, and other students are doing in Chicago and how that work uh, really challenges those stories of students who are disengaged or somehow don't care. Um, yeah, totally. I think one of the main points uh, that young people, even young people who aren't aware of the conditions that they're conditioned to, is rewriting the narratives that we have been put in. I think a lot of times when adults who are in positions of power um, decide what young people are going through, that create such a capacity for young people to be able to imagine and create and believe. And so if you tell someone that like, this is you and you're this small, right? In this big world, then that's what they're gonna believe and that's what they're gonna go by. Um, in Chicago right now, we're actually going through an election and our past mayor um, like literally went through so much of just like belittling Chicago's youth and, dehumanizing Chicago's youth. Um, and I could go on and on about that. Um, but the reaction from Chicago's youth exactly has continuously been rewriting our own stories. I think myself as an organizer, even in organizing spaces, has always been to rethink outside of the boxes that we already exist in, trying to find new tools. I think someone mentioned like new language and lenses, because when we instead inform young people and, and condition us to this box instead of allowing young people to write out our own stories. Um, we enable that kind of like learning loss um, narrative. But I think the other half of that 
narrative that young people are these bad people who need to be fixed um, and who are so small in this big world. I think the other half of that is definitely that we don't have the access to the things that make us larger, um, that make us feel bigger than life, um, that allow us to build our imaginations. And so when we don't have access to those resources or even that knowledge, um, in my African American dual credit studies class, we're like talking about these different theories. Um, and my teacher is always like, okay, what's something that you can connect to this? And some people talk about experiences that they've always had or like that they have before with like different classes. Um, and I've continuously responded about like, what if everyone had access to this knowledge, right? And it's intentional that we're put down and it's intentional that we don't know um, why we live in the world that we live in. It's intentional that we're segregated. It's intentional that we're redlined and don't have access um, to these different things. Uh, so I think that the response has always been resilience. Um, even in past generations of Chicago's young people has always been resilience. I think it's in like the air of Chicago. Um, but not only Chicago, all across the nation, young people are becoming woke, are, be, are aware of what is happening. I think the only question now is how do we move forward and how do we make that more tangible? And how do we make sure that the people are who, who are the most harmed and impacted are at the forefront of these fights? Uh, Kate, you, you know, you just have this beautiful command of the like language that you're inviting us to see these through. And, you know, when you said small and big, you know, um, that communicated so much. Um, and and this, this point you're making about um, the stories that people carry with them and how central those are. Um, so, so uh, deep. And Ali Khan, I'm going to turn to you. And, um, you know, you've described your school as this kind of place where many folks in the community and neighborhood have a stake. So neighbors, parents, students, teachers, also the teachers who attended the school as students uh, and administrators. I think you could talk a little bit more about the kind of this culture and vision for public schools as a place where everyone has a stake, right? And the school itself is central to the world that all of us are trying to build. No, thanks for that. And shout out, Kate, man, that was amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just what I heard Kate say, which is like, we don't, we don't have, I think you said we don't have like the place to see ourselves in the bigger thing, right? And I think like, I feel like the purpose of schools is how do we actually create the conditions for everybody to see themselves as a part of this bigger thing? Schools are not these, you know, places that are immune from society. Sometimes we pretend that we have to just reflect what they like. We have to reflect society in these ways that um, someone tells us to do so and blah, 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 blah. We really don't have to. And I think Adam said it really well. It is true historically that at the forefront of every change movement, there have been young people. I believe that sincerely. I come from a place called Oakland, California, where the Black Panthers were young people who radically changed the not only the material conditions of our society, but the radical imagination of our society. So when we think about that potential, that could happen in all of our schools, no matter where we are, right? Um, and so... So all that to say that any vision we're struggling for has to be a vision that actually centers BIPOC folks and what we need. Um, and what do we need? What's the most important thing that we need? I think we need each other. <laughs> I think we need each other. Um, we know we know the stats. 80% uh, of public educator, public school educators are white. 55% um, of, student, um, of students are people of color. Um, I've been lucky to work in a community uh, where we flip that a little bit, right? 100% of our students are students of color and 80% of our teachers are BIPOC folks. Um, and, uh, and in many cases, about like 20, 30% of our staff actually graduated from Oakland Public Schools, graduated from this school and are returned um, as alumni to work here. And then in, in, in some really beautiful cases for me personally, some of these folks were actually my students at a school that I taught at down a little further east in Oakland who have come and returned to this profession. Um, and so, I mean, maybe maybe lucky is not the word, actually. It, there's a little bit of work in there. And, and to be honest, I don't have like a Real, this is where that love thing comes in for me as to like what you we could be doing now to plant seeds for the future, because 
17 years ago, I did not know the seeds that I was planting per se, and not just me, but the whole community that we built. Um, I didn't know the seeds that we were planting. I didn't know that 17 years later, I'd be working with kids I've known since the kids, adults, amazing educators that I've known since they were 16, um, who uh, have become these, my family, right? And I, I think like that kind of family orientation is something that we should attune ourselves to, because to me, that's where the hope lives. Um, and when I say family, I just want to be very clear. Um, families are complex. Um, families are not just, it's not just, it's not just like, you know, cheesy love. It, it, it really is complex. We hold each other accountable as families. We push each other as families, right? So when we come back to this question. I'm not just talking about, oh, um, a vision for schools needs to be one in which we all feel good and connected to one another. Of course. But that vision also has to be that of family, where we actually hold each other to high ass standards, right? Because as family, we hold each other to standards. We push each other. Um, and that lives in academics. It does. And so for me, um, I think there has to be uh, the debate can't be, is it all about, you know, this path where we all make each other feel good or academics? I think there's a way to do both. And um, I believe that our vision for schools has to be one in which we're thinking about the long term, thinking about what it means to inspire people to return to this work uh, with the lens of justice and the lens of, of making the society they want to see. Thanks, Alejandro. That's so powerful. And just that reminder, like we live in a messy, messy world, a world where people are, you know, encouraged to humiliate one another, to turn their backs on one another. And these schools are the very sites and we can practice a different set of skills about accountability, avowal and connection. So um, uh, just such a rich site to think with. And I think this is a good time to bring Carla into the discussion. Um, so Carla, as you know, so many of these attacks on public, you know, that we've more recently witnessed have come under this guise of quote, uh, parental rights. And it's really constructed this image of students and especially younger students as kind of apolitical and always needing protection from educators, right? And from their unduly influence. And your uh, amazing book, Troublemakers, Lessons in Freedom from Young Children at School, you know, just starts from a much different account. So I hoping you can talk and, you know, your story certainly illustrated this, but what does that dominant narrative get wrong? And what does it fail to understand about the agency and vision of, of students in moving us beyond the current crisis? Yeah, I think sometimes even those of us who are really adept at talking about the power of young people forget this particular power of young children, kind of ignore their role in social change or imagine them as future change makers as they grow older rather than as people who impact their communities day in and day out. So I am tired of saying it, but children are full people. They are smaller <laughs> than us. But they are in all ways and in all regards, full human beings with full human rights. They are the opposite of apolitical. And so far as you know, being political is about understanding power, testing power, figuring out how to make decisions as groups, figuring out how to share resources in ways that are fair. They're doing that through their play and through their everyday interactions all the time. They are doing the work of politics. They're practicing the work of politics and they are much more naturally oriented to and frankly obsessed with fairness in ways you know that are like completely just natural to their development as young children. And so this idea that children are the property of parents, they are not. Children are not property. No human being is property. A child is not the property of their parent. And so um, I would like love for us to just really think hard about the power of young children in particular to be practicing a world that we want rather than a world that is because they are young and they have more time, right? So if we can get them practicing at two, three, four, and five, they have more years of practicing freedom, of practicing their responsibilities as free people. And so, you know, it's amazing that I still have to remind people that young children are full human beings and I see evidence of it every day. So I'll leave with just one more tiny story so that I know that we're um, short on time, but, you know, children also have almost no, reg no regard for the rule of law, okay? <laughs> like they do their own thing you know, against all odds, like they really are free, they're free people. And so I just think about 
even when no opportunity presents itself, how they find the crawl spaces to do what they want. And every day in our hallway, I walk past this line of artwork and all of the artwork is identical. The, the teacher had read them the book, The Beautiful Blackbird, but I think Ashley Bryan is the author. And they just did these blackbirds with, you know, these kind of rainbow stripes coming out. Anyway, they all look exactly the same. And then on one second graders in the corner, she wrote, the rise of the blackbird, you know, and it was, she was certainly not invited to do that, but here she is coming off a month of like amazing Black History Month programming that happened at our school. And so even when they're not really given an opportunity to make a political statement, they take whatever opportunities they create for themselves. And so it's just so important to take them seriously as whole people. And I'm uh, grateful for that question. Um, thanks, Carla. I just love, you know, that returning us to this idea of classrooms as sites where students are already practicing freedom. Um, uh, what a kind of compelling and important um, uh, insight. So, um, Alakan, Kate, and Carla, uh, just grateful for that interaction. Really look forward to coming back for our uh, final round um, to get your thoughts about, yeah, this question about where we where we do go from here. We're going to welcome back now uh, Jackson, Nima, and Adam. Um, and Great to be with all of you. Um, just to do one more round here, and you know, part of what we'll uh, talk about, hey Jackson, is um, you know, so many of the decisions that are made about schools in our current moment uh, are made by people that don't spend their days in the classroom talking to teachers, engage with teachers and students, um, and yet we still always know that it's. Uh, teachers and students who are holding concrete, real practical solutions for the problems that their, their schools face, uh, even as they're rarely given decision making power. Um, so here we're thinking about the ways that educators carve out places in spite of not being <laughs> invited to do so, carve out places of leadership and direction and vision. Um, uh, against the strictures that say that's not your your role. So Jackson, let's start with you. You know, you're a vice president of the Chicago's Teachers Union. You spend a lot of time with teachers listening to their vision, right? What do they, what do they see and imagine for their own schools? Um, and, you know, in the last 15 years, the CTU has really demonstrated that unions can both fight for wages and working conditions that teachers need and deserve to make this a dignified life and occupation, but also link those efforts to a vision of public education in which everyone can thrive. So I'm hoping to start us off. Can you just say a little bit more about that, about the role of the Chicago Teachers Union? And I think unions more generally in asserting this role for teachers as champions and visionaries of public education. Yeah, first, I, you know, I just want to mention a lot of Americans are experiences to have a dem opportunity to shape democracy like twice a year or once every four years or whatever it is. And the union movement, like we have democracy by workers, for workers, 365 days a year. Like, I don't think because it's outside the normal experience as labor has been attacked, we appreciate as an institution that there's a lot of similar similar qualities to what public schools bring. And at CTU, I spend time talking both to students and to teachers and paraprofessionals about, you know, why is it that we have a contract that references safe and healthy working conditions? Why is it that it has to reference textbooks? Why does it have to say something about academic freedom and anti-racist curriculum? Well, because those things have been violated or you have asbestos in your classroom or lead pipes and lead paint or lack of materials and appropriate resources and staffing. And so we've had to fight for these things over a long period of time and help memorialize them through struggle. And one of the ways that this shows up for me personally and for us organizationally, you know, I was a, a first grader in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, in 1984, I'll age myself. And I went to one of the better funded schools, right? There is a lot of inequity within public schools. Let's not fool ourselves. And we didn't have full-time social workers or full-time nurses. While I was handing out literature on election day to elect one of our own, because Brandon is better, he's about to become the first educator ever elected to uh, Chicago as mayor. And um, I was talking to a social worker and she described what her life is like since we won for the first time in over 100 years in our contract, a full-time social worker and a full-time nurse in every classroom across the district. 
And she said, I've been a social worker for 32 years. And the last two years have been absolutely transformational because I've been able to focus my attention in one school every day on a group of young people. And it's made a transformative difference. And so to me, that's really a testament to what we fight for, how we do it with community, and how it has broader social impact for transformation. Thanks, Jackson. I just I so appreciate there how you're talking about something like very, very concrete and material in a contract actually opens up and unleashes all of these other kinds of possibilities. And of course, that educators see that directly, right? <laughs> like, I want to be supported in doing my role uh, to advance the school. Let Nima, let's turn to you now in Boston. So, I mean, similarly, the Boston teachers have been I mean, really, this is a national model, central in developing a new ethnic studies program and curriculum for Boston public schools and advocating for the resources and support to make the program a success. And this really is building on the idea of teachers as scholars and writers and curriculum developers, uh, student advocates and much more. So can you talk a little bit more about you know, how you and your colleagues in the union understood ethnic studies and anti-racist education as a foundational issue for the union and the kind of collaborative process in the curriculum development and teacher support work you've been doing? Sure thing. You know, I think the most important thing to remember is that um, schools and classrooms are ecosystems, right? And they only function if the relationships are healthy and if uh, and if the folks in those contexts are listening to each other. And so really, um, so much of the movement for ethnic studies was the product of educators listening to their students and listening to their students ask questions about why why do we learn certain curriculum and not learn other things? Why is so much of what we're taught external to us? Why are our communities not the site of learning? Why are our identities not at the center of learning? Those are questions I think have only become even more intensified um, in the context of COVID, um, where young people, you know, counter to the learning loss narrative, young people were learning a lot of things outside of school. They were learning things that were of deep interest and meaning to them, but that isn't necessarily what they were being offered in schools. I think educators were hearing young people be hungry for a kind of learning in schools that wasn't happening. Um, it wasn't happening in the context of package curriculum. It wasn't happening in the context of standardized testing and that dictates what you can learn. And so ethnic studies really emerged as a way to respond to young people who are hungry to know more about themselves, know more about their communities, know more about their history. What's so powerful is that that was um, teacher and student led work that happened outside um, it happened in the context of the union. It wasn't something that the district was initiating. It was the union and educators and young people pushing and pushing and pushing from the outside to say, we want this, we want this. We're gonna work to, we're gonna write a curriculum before there, we're gonna write grants to write curriculum before there's even any infrastructure, right? And then we're gonna push you to fund infrastructure. And we went from having one funded position um, to this year we have eight funded ethnic studies positions. We have two coaches and six hybrid teachers who teach for half of their day, but for the other half of their day are collaborating with one another to build curriculum and work together to problem solve and think about how do we do ethnic studies work with our young people. Uh, none of that would have happened if educators hadn't started by listening and responding to the young people in their classrooms. And I think that that's for me like the most important thing to think about because that's so often the opposite of what's happening when it comes to decision making around our schools. 99% of the time, the decisions that are being made are not connected to the ideas or feelings or thoughts of young people at all. And that's why I think so often initiatives imposed on our schools fail um, because we're not listening to what young people are saying. And in this in this model and in this moment, that's, that is what happened. We listen to young people and we're building from what they say. Um, I, that's just, you know, like the reminder that it's not just that it's like top down and teachers being instructed, but that always will come at the cost of students getting it, being invited to envision their own education um, and, and transforming those dynamics, uh, the kind of how central that is. And just that point about not waiting for the district to design a curriculum that we can teach, but insisting, you know, the kind of we are the ones we've been waiting for to be able to do this. Um, and Adam, that's a, a good, you know, transition to take us to you. 
Um, we know that over the last 20 years, we've just seen this proliferation for K-12 educators of prepackaged curriculum textbooks, insisting teachers either teach to the test or to certain kind of metrics um, that really denies them the opportunity to co-create curricula, pedagogy, et cetera. Um, but you and your colleagues in Philadelphia, and this is true for many teachers in the kind of Rethinking Schools network, uh, have taken a much different approach so I understand Philadelphia, I think since 2005, has required all students to take an African-American history class to graduate. Um, but you've really insisted that teachers and students be at the center of how that class is envisioned, expanded, and taught. So can you talk a little bit more um, about that work and also just that role of supporting and inviting and developing uh, teachers to be writers, creators, and designers of their own curriculum and pedagogy? Sure. Um, let me let me just start by saying I, I wish this was a union pushed <laughs> um, uh, activity that we're engaging here. And I and I have to you know shout out to all of us who are still um, in fairly undemocratic unions operating on the old business model. Um, and I you know so much so much solidarity and and maybe a little bit of jealousy out to y'all in uh, Chicago and, and Boston. Um, you know, but the interesting thing about Philly is that this, this kind of top-down mandate for African-American history, of course, there's a whole history goes back to the 1960s of students fighting for African-American history. Um, but the, the mandate in 2005 opens up, opens up this um, place in Philly where we need an African-American history curriculum. And that's not a very, <laughs> in 2005, there's not a ton of you know, ready to go curriculum out there. And so that begins a process by which, um, te this before I'm even in Philly, teachers have gotten together, begun to put together curriculum. Um, and uh, the latest um, social studies uh, educator, and really the, the district has a team now of curriculum specialists um, have the but the latest social studies uh, development specialist, an incredible person from um, our social justice caucus here in Philly, um, Ishmael Jimenez, um, just took uh, the reins, I think, of that position a year or two ago, and began putting teams together to rewrite the district curriculum and has said, you know, we're not going to um, get any more textbooks. We are going to hire our own um, to create, to recreate this, this curriculum. Um, and that has opened up a lot of space for teacher created um, curriculum in Philadelphia. Um, but I'll just, you know, to say really about the question of the importance here, I think maybe even a better example is what we've done in the Zen Education Project with the Teach Reconstruction Campaign. Because um, if you look at the way reconstruction was taught in schools for nearly a century, right? It was essentially a racist narrative crafted by ex-Confederates um, that was popularized by uh, the Dunning School historians at Columbia and then birth of a, the film, Birth of a Nation, right? And it's, and it's really not till the, the, the 1970s and 80s where you get um, a whole new crop of historians after the civil rights movement that totally devastate and debunk this history. Of course, there's folks like Du Bois who had been doing it decades earlier, um, but but this becomes now the there's a new established consensus that you know this is an openly racist narrative. We should not be teaching this. Um, but that that new historical consensus doesn't actually filter down in the K through 12 state standards into um, the textbooks and so forth, because they still teach a top-down perspective. They still and they still have these remnants of the old racist Dunning School, right? Um, and so that, so for me, you know, that this is what the Teach Reconstruction campaign that is an education project has led is about: is that we actually need teacher experts to who understand. Um, the, the new historical consensus and can translate that for students into curricula because the textbooks are not doing it, the state standards are not doing it, right? Um, and so we have to build the space um, through our unions, through our districts um, for teachers to get release time to do this sort of work, right? Thanks. I mean, there's just so much there and about also just, I think you're reminding us like, 
attention to what the larger narratives are that are going to be structuring all of the curriculum and pedagogy, and that we have to lay claim to that as well, not simply what's in a scope and sequence or what essential questions are, but what's the larger narrative at work here. The fantastic exchanges. I learned so much. I'm grateful, uh, Jackson, Adam, and Nima, and looking forward to this next round. Sierra, what did you think there of the uh, that last exchange? Oof. Well, I don't know about you, Dan, but I'm feeling so fired up right now. Yeah, 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 that I'm yeah. taking, there's so much that I'm taking from that conversation. Yeah. I was furiously typing notes and I just keep coming back to people power, right? We need yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that people built these systems and structures of oppression and as people, we can disrupt and create something better. So with the two conversations, that's really what I keep coming back to is just being reminded of the power of solidarity. And so I'm excited for this next phase of the competition of the yeah. conversation, because yeah. we'll be diving into that a bit more. So as we go into this next portion, we're really going to be thinking about how as abolitionists teach us that we both have to dismantle and build. A quote that grounds and guides me comes from Robin D.G. Kelly. He says, without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We not only end up confused, rudderless, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us. And so I've learned from my comrades in organizing that once something has been transformed, it can never go back to the way that it was. So how do we truly transform? How can we imagine and construct? That's why there are these attacks, because the opposition knows that we have joy and creativity on our side, and they try to exhaust us. So we don't have the capacity to dream, because when we're not well, we can't show up to the movement. But I love that we are resisting that by having this conversation. And so I'd like to turn to uh, Daxon and Ali Khan to kick off this part of the conversation, really to just think about some insights and some advice about what can be possible. And so uh, Jackson, I'd love to turn to you first in your role. What are the policies that we need to be organizing for in our schools and unions? Like I was just learning so much from you from what you shared about what a democratic process can look like as teachers organize and, and, and unionize. Yeah, the beautiful thing about teachers organizing, taking strikes for not just themselves, but their students and the broader community, this bargaining for the common good is we, we have Boston as a critical example where they worked with their mayor to get 4,000 units of affordable housing for their unhoused students. You know, our mayor told us that that was not germane to a contract. So we just fired her and we're going to get a teacher in there who is responsive to the needs of young people. And it's almost all black students, uh, increasingly Latin as more students are coming from Texas and Florida. Um, but that's the kind of transformation that we need to see. And, and Bettina Love has a good piece in Ed Week, this issue, where she says, you know, we can't really teach Black Lives Matter. We can't teach Black history without Black teachers. And we've seen, you know, I, I think Ali Khan has, has pointed this out, a huge reduction in the number in Chicago and Philly and New Orleans, wherever the attacks and privatization have happened, it's le it's led to displacement of black teachers and black families. And so, um, you know, Minneapolis, I think, has shown us the way they just voted up a contract that gave super seniority to black teachers. So not only do we have to fight for students and families, not just our members in our unions, but we have to fight for the people in our unions who are being attacked the most. So in our 2019 agreement, we raised salaries by a historic 41% for our paraprofessionals who are exclusively, you know, black and Latin A women, predominantly, I should say, uh, like 90 plus percent. And those are workers that have been paid the least. And so if we can really tackle white supremacy and have solidarity, it means that white teachers have to be willing to say, I don't expect the, the, the privileges, the um, advantages in my union contract that we need to bestow on people who have been attacked you know, so much through this racist system. So those are the kind of things that I think would really make schools stronger places that connect with our communities. Yes, yes, yes. You are getting right at the root 
of these issues and, and really thinking about what equity is, but how do we actually enact it in our everyday practices? So with that, I'll turn it to you, Ali Khan. What are, what are the policies that we need to be organizing for in our schools? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not far away from what Jackson's saying. I think we, I'm talking to, I imagine I'm talking to a lot of educators who definitely have been system, systemically undervalued in our profession from the very beginning of our careers. We enter this career I know I entered this career because of my um, my push to to be a change agent in society because I see schools as these sites of of change and power. Um, unfortunately, uh, in every other aspect of this work, we are just totally and utterly disrespected. Um, you know, it's unfortunate in like you know the capitalist world that we got to assign money to our value, but I mean it is a simple truth. What are the barriers for people of color to engage with this work? living our lives. You cannot live in Oakland, California on a teacher's salary. You just cannot. It's literally impossible, right? We're having discussions about changing district buildings into teacher dorms. Where's the dignity in that? What does that even mean, right? And so when I think about like the where we're going to for quote unquote creative solutions, it, it, it it's a little disturbing to consider the fact that we wouldn't be really focusing our efforts on how to ensure that teachers are paid like doctors, because that's what we are in society, right? That's what we should be respected as in society. So I think um, the professionalizing of the profession is something that I feel very passionate about. And I saw a question in the Q&A about um, what it means to be um, a, uh, a school leader um, in this place and where is our sites of things. So I'll speak to that specifically because that is my kind of position at the moment, right? And I think a lot of professionalizing actually comes from the work of actually teaching and learning and professionalizing the work that we do to build ourselves as educators, because education is an art. I mean, teaching is an art. If you if you're into this work, you know that it it, it is more Picasso than it is, you know, uh, I can't think of the other word, but like, you know, a structured kind of boring thing. There, There's a lot of art and beauty in this work. And so when we think about the investments, so one thing you have as a principal is you do have hopefully control of your budget somehow. Please take in curriculum, please hide from the district if you have to do what you got to do to create space in your school, not to just simply do what the curriculum outlines, but to create ways for teachers to one, build their artful professions, their artful skills, also to interact with curriculum and build curriculum that's actually soulful for young people, right? Because kids need to come to school and feel invigorated in their souls. And if we're just giving them packet after packet and worksheet after worksheet, why would you show up? <laughs> so uh, for my principals out there, for my school leaders out there, take the small places that you have control of and just run with them. Budget, curriculum, whatever you can get. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because I think that's something that you and Jackson both mentioned is this idea that budgets are moral documents, right? Budgets tell stories about what we value and what we don't. And we see that that's very intentional, how money is often weaponized as a way to uh, deprofessionalize the profession, when in reality, we should be investing. And there's been a long-term disinvestment from public schools for very strategic reasons. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Now to continue the conversation, one thing that Jackson and Ali Khan also both mentioned is the concept of solidarity and, and building solidarity, whether it be with administration and teachers, teachers and other teachers. So I'd like to talk to Kate and Nima a little bit more about how do we do the both and work of staying rooted in supporting our communities while also building solidarity in coalitions across states, across geographic regions. I've seen a lot of questions come through the chat, folks in places like Iowa and Florida. So how do we, right, thinking about our panel, Boston, Chicago, DC, how do we um, extend support and solidarity to folks who are experiencing the brunt of the anti-CRT, anti-Black and anti-queer and trans laws and curriculum bans? So Kate, I'd love to turn to you first to talk to us a little bit about solidarity and, and how do we do the both and work? Um, yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things is that we learn it ourselves. Um, I think that there are different ways to view solidarity um, and there are different ways to approach it as well. Um, I know here in Chicago, 
I like Jackson and I worked together. Jackson actually just plugged Brandon. Uh, but I actually plugged CTU today at school. Like, like literally, it, it's simple things like that, but it's building those relationships and connections. Um, and it's learning to have that within ourselves as well. I'm always dropping bell hooks quotes, but bell hooks talked about community and communion um and we can't reflect those things if we don't do the same things for ourselves you know um and I think that when we are given the access to that love to be able to love on ourselves and hug on ourselves then we can do it for our communities and then we can go on and extend hands um and grace for folks who are in those sanctuaries where they're being attacked um, I know even like organizations in Chicago, I think it was Haymarket Books sent out books to like folks in Florida. Um, it's actions like that, but it's also educating students here um, in different places where we hold that kind of privilege about the conditions in other sanctuaries. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, things that were happening on like in our own city um, with my classmates and they were just so stunned that in the exact same city that these like bizarre things were happening and that people were being displaced and like just so many different things. But if we aren't aware of the things that's happening, then we can't really, you know, take action upon it ourselves. So I think when we talk about like what radicalizes us and what builds us forward, I think that the center of that is knowledge um, and having the care and respect enough for people who are in those conditions and sanctuaries to be able to acknowledge our, our own privilege and then go ahead and then kind of imagine what can we do for others uh, simultaneously with ourselves as well. Oh, yes, that was a whole word. I love that you were talking about we have to practice this for ourselves. And what does it mean, like Carla was talking about earlier, to practice living out the world that we're trying to build every day in each of our interactions and experiences with each other. And I love that you plug the book giveaways. I'll do a quick plug, too, that are Rethinking Schools. We've been able to give out copies of Teaching for Black Lives and Solidarity with Florida ed Educators. And I think the more that we can come together and do these sorts of things and support one another, like you said, Caitlin, with, with knowledge, and extending opportunities to be in conversation and to continue to build that understanding, the better. Because that's really, I, I love that you're pointing to that piece of solidarity for us. Thank you. Nima, I'd love to turn to you next to think about solidarity. What does that look like? What does it feel like? How do we, how do, we do this both and strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I want to say is while the intensity of these attacks seems to be um, largely in uh, red places currently, I don't think it's going to stay there. Um, I think that uh, those places are just sort of like at the front uh, of what is coming to all of us everywhere. So I think in some ways we have to um, disabuse ourselves of the idea that this is not going to happen in Boston or not going to happen in Philly. I think it's going to happen everywhere. And we would be better off if we acknowledge that and sort of really got together with people who are experiencing it first to be like, okay, let's learn. Like, how do we learn from you about what this has looked like? And then how do we work together to figure out what we're going to do from here? I think the second thing that I would say, and I really appreciated what Kate was saying, um, is to really hold on to people's humanity. Even in the reddest, reddest place you can imagine, um, there are queer people and Black people and immigrants in those spaces, and they are living their lives and fighting for their lives, and they deserve their full humanity, and they deserve for us to see them. Um, and I think so often right now in the, in the narrative that's playing out in our country, um, spaces and places are just so reduced that we forget um, that there are queer folks in those places and trans folks in those places. And we write off entire states and we're like, well, forget about Florida, forget about Kentucky, forget about this place. And it's like, you can't do that. Um, there are real people in these places who these policies are coming down on. And we need to extend solidarity to those people and we need to bring them closer to us because they really need us right now. So I think the biggest thing we can do is to recognize that shared space and keep leaning into the shared space instead of sort of putting up these false distinctions of like, well, we're in a city and they're in a rural place or we're in a blue state and they're in a red state. I think those distinctions are really harming us um, 
and making it easier, I think, for forces that are seeking to sow division. Um, I think it's working. I think they are sowing division because we're losing sight of our shared solidarity. Yes, absolutely. That divide and conquer strategy continues to be uh, at the helm of white supremacy culture, right? And so how do we disrupt and dismantle that, Nima, like you were saying, by holding on to people's humanity. I, I really love that. And everything that you're saying too about the chilling effects, we see it in so many different places. I know I've been in conversation with a teacher in Massachusetts who the superintendent is taking legal action against her for having Black Lives Matter sign in her classroom, right? I've talked to folks in New Jersey where it's my home state where that's happening in Jersey too. So it's happening everywhere. And so we have to uh, really be strategic about holding on to that humanity and extending extending care, extending love, extending support and learning together so that we can use that as a foundation to continue to move forward. So I appreciate you both feeling so energized from this conversation. And as we continue on, I'd like to turn to Adam and Carla because we were just talking about the chilling effects of this legislation. And I think that lends itself to the next part of this conversation really around safety, because a lot of folks are feeling and are unsafe in their classrooms, in their schools, in their communities because of this pushback. And so how do we keep each other safe? What does safety look and feel like, especially when there's been a lot of pushback against police-free schools and abolition? And how do we explore conversations about safety with students? So Adam, I'd like to turn to you first. Yeah, um, you know, one of the stories I um, just can't, I, I can't get out of my head has been it, the earlier this year in Philadelphia, um, there was a student who was shot outside of, uh, after a football game, who was the, the son of a Philadelphia teacher. Um, and he was shot by other uh, Philadelphia students teenagers, right? I have a teacher at our school who taught one of the students um, who are not, you know, who are now in jail. And, um, and there's a real epidemic of gun violence, right? And, and, you know, an uptick in crime in, in cities. And I think this is a real, um, th this is scary for a number of reasons, because I think um, especially, you know, there's there's limited control in a city over over gun over gun control as at the state level, and so what city officials tend to do, right, is like push law and order politics, push more police. Um, the school the school district of Philadelphia is pushing for more police outside of our schools, right? Um, you see this kind of politics with Eric Adams in New York, um, and then on the other side, of course, right? Like it's not like the people from who came out in 2020 are, are gone, right? Like that, though there, that was, you know, think of that as a, tr as a tree of protest that planted seeds all over this country, right? Um, and, and you see that, right? Like who, the, the other person who's running, uh, who's like running against, in a runoff with the uh, Brandon Johnson in Chicago, is that like Paul Vallis, right? Like the Paul Vallis from like New Orleans, public school disaster, right? Like, you know, th these are the choices we have right now, right? Um, and, you know, and, and that's a real danger in cities um, as, as these kind of law and order folks kind of take control. And I think it's really important to reframe the narrative. And the, the other story I, I've been thinking about, right, is in Pennsylvania, we just had this big court decision that says for decades, the Pennsylvania legislature has been unconstitutionally um, underfunding our schools, right? And so it just begs the question, like who are the real criminals here, right? Is it, is it the teenagers, right, who've been disinvested from, who have few resources at their school, no mental health resource access, right? Aren't able to see a vibrant future in their community. And so they pick up a gun, right? to shoot other teenagers, right? Or is it these legislators that have unconstitutionally disinvested in that teenager, you know, school and community uh, and, and created the conditions they are operating in, right? And, but no one is arresting those people, 
right? No one is arresting those legislators. And maybe, you know, that might be a good function for our school safety officers. Maybe we could send them down to Harrisburg um, to arrest some of those folks. Um, but I think, I think we have to reframe some of these conversations about crime and law and order, because if we don't, you know, um, uh, we're, we're <laughs> hopefully we're not going to get Bob Alice, right? Um, we, we need the Helen Gibbs, the, the Brandon Johnsons, um, and that, and that is going to take reframing this conversation. Yes. I appreciate you so much for talking about how we reframe the narrative because the stories that have been passed down are stories that is, are so harmful, right? These dominant narratives and how do we provide the counter narratives that show how we keep us safe. And on that note, Carla, I'd really love to turn to you to talk even more about safety. What does it look like? What does it feel like? How do we engage in these conversations with, with young children? I agree that our inclination, given the violence of the world, is to double down on already failed strategies of safety. And so as we are less and less and less safe, somehow our common sense is telling us to do more of the same dumb ideas, you know, that have not helped us in all of this time. And so we have to do the opposite of our instincts, I think. And so this bucket of policing, of surveillance, of doubling and tripling down on control is the opposite strategy. So we want to like swing in the total <laughs> opposite direction and recognize that in fact, the only way for every person to be safe is for every person to practice their freedom responsibly. Violence and control and surveillance will never ever get us safety. The only way for every person to be safe is for every other person to mind their responsibility as someone who is um, committed to keeping us safe. So how do we talk to young children about it? We say to them, we keep us safe. We protect everyone's bodies and feelings. We say that as a mantra all day, every day. We keep us safe. We protect everyone's bodies and feelings. And we act as educators in, teach, in the teaching and learning of how difficult it actually is to protect everyone's bodies and feelings. And we are real with young children that there are times when I may want to do something, but it will harm you. And that those are times to teach and learn, right? To discuss, to debate, to think about who's had this problem before. And so I often think about that proverb, right? Like the child will burn the village down just to feel its warmth. I am not naive. I live in the world like everybody else, but I genuinely believe that starting with young children, we need to teach and learn consent, care, you know, communion, community, collectivism. These are, this is the kind of teaching and learning starting with our infants and our toddlers and those in early childhood to teach them like the only viable model of safety is that anyone who can do harm is responsible for keeping everybody else safe. And so we can all do harm. We are all responsible for keeping each other safe. And I, I think people dismiss this strategy as naive given the violence of the world. It's not naive. We can't keep practicing the world we already have. We have to practice an otherwise world and that is one where we take responsibility for the well-being of other human beings. Oh, yes. So, so moving. I appreciate you both for outlining the harms of what the narratives say about safety and how we can get in front of that narrative to tell a better story, a more loving, more human-centered story about how we can be with each other in this world. I appreciate you both so much. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Natalia to guide us through the question and answer portion. Hello, everybody. I um, just feel really moved by so much of what was shared today. And we are definitely short on time. Um, but luckily, I think we've answered a lot of your questions throughout the panel. And I'm just going to pull on some strands from several questions and um, any of the panelists, and we can have the panelists, you know, join us on the screen, um, can answer maybe even just one person um, to answer. So um, 
as we mentioned earlier, we're working within these often um, dehumanizing systems and we're getting pushback sometimes from folks within our own communities as we fight. And so maybe we could have just one or two people briefly tell us what's one way that you stay energized, well, hopeful, or connected. One way you're staying well, hopeful, energized, connected uh, amidst it all. Who wants to give us a little a little something to as we near our close? I stay with young kids. That's it. They're hilarious. They are brilliant. And they are the only reason I get up in the morning half the time. Yes. I would say connected to that, that I stay in touch with a lot of my former students because seeing them as adults helps me to remember why this work is so important. Um, and they give me a lot of hope um, because of the adults that they've become. Yes, yes. Wow, you're able to, you all are packing so much wisdom in just like 10 second bits. Who else has a little, a little piece for us? Colleagues, you got to find colleagues that you can vibe with so essential akin to what Nima said I just pop into Hector Kokula's class he's the best teacher in the school and I've seen him since he was 16 and it makes me joyful every day yes I think just working with Caitlin you know having her <laughs> leadership to help direct teacher student solidarity and put us in conversation with one another so we're co-thinking and strategizing together is really a, a huge lift in, in our Chicago space. Uh, I would definitely add on to that and <clears throat> uh, acknowledging and like taking moments to breathe and acknowledge the greatness of like the unique experience that we get to have um I'm a huge believer that Chicago is the best city to ever live in um and just being able to analyze the different aspects that makes up the lifestyle here um and be intentional with the way that I interact with people and the way that I treat myself and the way that I engage in my community definitely keeps me going because if I was not intentional I would not be here <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for this um, unique experience that we all got to be a part of. Um, let's bring Sierra back for, for a quick closing. Um, just feeling so much gratitude um, to all of you, uh, the audience and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. And thank you to each of you for sharing those beautiful reflections. I'll just say a couple more thank yous and extend my gratitude to my co-moderators, Natalia and Dan. Thank you to all of the panelists, Ali Khan, Kate, Jackson, Carla, Adam, and Nima. I've learned so much from you this evening and I'm feeling so hopeful and so inspired about the possibilities of what we can create together. Thank you to Shannon and Crystal, our ASL interpreters. Thank you to Ursula, Marco, and Daisha for tech support on the back end. Thank you to Rethinking Schools and the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective. And as we just close out, reminding ourselves of the question that brought us all here together tonight, where do we go from here? And the panelists each shared so many sparks about what that could mean. It's beautiful to see folks come together in solidarity to share knowledge, to be in community and share space, to experience joy and laughter in hard times. Kate pointed us to how intentional these structures and systems are, but it's learning. And Nima reminded us the language and the lenses, learning these language and lenses to process the hard that exists. And then also the importance of needing to listen and learn from each other, from students, from other educators, and take action, actually taking action by be re being reminded of our humanity. Um, like Jackson pointed us to teacher and student solidarity. Carla reminding us of the power of young children to practicing the world that we want rather than the world that is. Practicing freedom and practicing be being free people. Ali Khan reminded us that this work is rigorous and we have to be radical about love. And Adam reminded us that classrooms and schools are laboratories for justice. So let's continue building together. Let's keep fighting. Let's be in solidarity. Most importantly, let's lean into love because that's what will counter all of the hard. 
Thank you all so much again. We're gonna follow up with an email with more information and resources that were shared throughout the conversation today. This conversation is being recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube page. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you sending love, solidarity and light to all. Walking and talking with my mind You know that it's safe